Welcome. Uh, I have the distinct honor of welcoming to the Center for Strategic and International Studies the Italian Chief of Defense, uh, Admiral Giuseppe Cavo Dragone. Uh, he is, he's got a long and distinguished career uh, in the uh, Italian military, particularly the Italian Navy. Uh, for those interested in his uh, activities in the U.S., he's uh, been involved in flight training in the Naval Air Station Pensacola in Florida and in Corpus Chris, uh, Christi, Texas. Uh, he was also carrier qualified on board the USS Lexington uh, in January of 1990. Um, he's done tours including in Yuma, Arizona. Uh, he was previously, he was the uh, uh, chief of the Italian Navy uh, from 2019 to 2021 uh, and from November of 2021 until today he is the chief of defense for Italy. So. Welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. We are very honored to have you here. And let me just first broadly uh, ask you a question. We've had a lot uh, changing in the world uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the war uh, that started at the end of February. So uh, as you look at, at Italy and defense priorities and the role uh, and the evolution of NATO in the European Union, where are your uh, defense priorities right now with that changing landscape. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me here. A caveat, I mean, since I've, uh, since I've been trained by the Marine Corps, my English is brutal. So I will... It's be better than mine, I think, <laughs> though, so... I will, be, I will try to go through my stuff, not to forget anything, because I mean, I think it's, it is worthy, and I want to, to miss anything, as I told you, so... Uh, I'm delighted to be to be here with you today, and thank you for inviting me. Of course, the, about in, uh, in April 26, in uh, the U.S. Uh, air base in Ramstein, Germany, the Italian Ministry of Defense and I uh, attended a meeting of more than 40 nations willing to help Ukraine with military and humanitarian uh, aid. We announced the formation of what we call the Ukraine Contact Group. Uh, which includes uh, the ministers of defense and the military chiefs of uh, defense of the participating unit, uh, nations. Uh, on that occasion, I had the feeling, the strong feeling, that the Russian aggression to Ukraine represents really a turning point, not only for the Atlantic community, but also for the international community as a whole. Indeed, the unjustified Russian attack as an endangering worldwide implication and will change security paradigms on a global scale. This is clear that if we want to react better and more adequately to emerging conflict and instabilities and prevent wider conflicts, we must pool and share military capabilities more substantially and effectively and create an overall better deterrence if needed a powerful response. Within the current Allied and European frameworks, the presence of the Italian military stretches from Iceland uh, to the Baltic, through Eastern Europe and down to the Balkans. Along the southern border of the Alliance, Italian forces are deployed in Iraq, Red Sea, Mediterranean, and across North Africa, as well as in the Sahel, up to the Gulf of Guinea. Europe and the Atlantic Alliance uh, never, can never go back to the world that they knew before Russia invaded Ukraine. This is now a widening consensus that NATO needs permanent forces in Eastern Europe to deter Russia. This challenge is about the ability of the European Union and the Alliance to respond to these threats, bolster cohesion and improve strategic reliance across domains, including cyberspace. And uh, it is fair to say that this momentum is uh, currently drawing the European Union and NATO closer and closer. After the Versailles Declaration, the European Union adopted the so-called strategic compass, an ambitious plan, uh, plan of action to strengthen its security and defense 
and uh, its capability to contribute to international peace and stability more effectively. Of course, European integration in security and defense matters is not simple. Nevertheless, the strategic compass requires that our full support and commitment, protecting our society and freedoms is a joint responsibility among nations. If we are to deliver on the promise of peace we have made to future generations as it was done to us, security and defense must, must play a more prominent role in the European project. The tragedy unfolding in Ukraine should not overshadow the issue of NATO southern flank. The Mediterranean basin is at a crossroad for petroleum and gas exploitation on both land and sea, which is uh, all the more crucial given our need to reduce our energy reliance on Russian sources. The market increase in unfriendly naval activity in the Mediterranean indicates that we should not lose sight of this geopolitical area, for it remains a dangerous, as dangerous today as it always has been and a flashpoint of conflict and the regional instability that affects us all. The Mediterranean Sea lines of communication must remain secure especially to accommodate the growing energy needs for Europe. This very need should not be dependent on Russia in the future. And uh, in this context, we are developing and widening our military cooperation with other Atlantic partners, such as Turkey, France and UK. This is strengthening again and show the importance of acting together for the greater good of the uh, international community as a whole. Regarding our military environment, the Ukrainian crisis shows the clear need of Europe and the alliance to face the challenges associated with the closer integration of our forces, not only nationally, but across the other operational domain as well. The ongoing Russian offensive proves how Moscow attempts to embrace multi-domain capabilities while prioritizing offensive space, cyber and cognitive skills. For the last two decades, we have repeatedly heard about the new Russian military, a powerful joint force grounded in high technology. While that force is indeed potent, the announced leap in technology we have heard about may not have been fully developed and widely fielded as appears, nor as adequately supported as Russia has led the world to believe. Against this background, we must not underestimate our eastern neighbor. We are also witnessing the rise of military in, militaries in Asia and their ability to project force outside their normal sphere of influence. A good example nowadays uh, of this was a Chinese military aircraft flying from China to the Balkans to deliver Chinese surface-to-air missile systems to a European country. And this is unprecedented. A dramatic change are underway and we must keep pace. If we are to maintain our leading edge uh, over these near-peer adversaries, we must develop and field the technologies of tomorrow as soon as possible. We need sixth-generation capabilities to enable European Union forces to operate effectively in the night airspace. We also need to the complementary technologies supporting either manned uh, or unmanned area vehicles in the air domain. Our land forces must be able to shoot, move, and communicate easily. We must embrace the modern electromagnetic environment through such technologies, such as software-defined radios. We have a daily confirmation of the devastating consequences the Russian forces suffer since they are unable to shoot, move, and communicate in a coordinated fashion. 
We have recently seen another case in point in the maritime domain. A subsonic cruise missile hit and sunk a major surface combatant ship. Maybe two, we don't know yet, but probably. We must provide our navies with the, the highest technology available to detect and neutralize threats as far away as possible. These threats include ballistic cruise and hypersonic missiles that only advanced electronically scanned array radars associated with the new generation interceptor actuators can detect and neutralize. We must also protect our undersea cables and communication networks because they are critical to our world economy and everyday lives. Of course, with the advanced weaponry and tactics come the need to secure our systems with the state of the art cyber security systems. Therefore, we must continually seek to develop our cyber capabilities in both the defensive and offensive arenas. I would emphasize the importance of our military personnel as well. The battlefield of Ukraine shows what can happen to an army that invested in technology without effectively fielding its new system by ensuring proper logistic support and training. Two elements so crucial to a military force that relies on high technologies. We can invest in technology, but we must also invest in our people and the relevant support infrastructure at home and in the field. Our people are our greatest assets, and without them, the technology we strive to develop will be ineffective. The geopolitical, these geopolitical and technological scenarios present challenges that our military doctrine and defense industrial base cannot fail to overcome. Firstly, the multi-domain army concept introduced a radical change in joint warfighting. The joint force commander must be able, must be, and must be enable the joint forces to maneuver and prevail through all phases of a conflict with the, a calibrated force posture in multi-domain capabilities. The dynamic employment and posture of joint forces during any confrontation will provide the range in depth to penetrate complex system and achieve cross-domain effects, thus creating opportunities and providing options to deter, de-escalate, or promptly transition to a winning strategy. Secondly, we should accelerate the process leading to the adaptation and evolution of our military posture the transformation of our doctrine and the building of new organizations and change the way we think and train. The current conflict has shown what can happen to an army that does not value proper training, doctrine and professional military education. Joint formation and capability achieve their skill and speed both physical and cognitive through an emphasis and investment in constant training. Good training and doctrine lead to the decisive employment of our forces and lead us to reach a rapid decision cycle that support faster paced, distributed and complex operating environment. Thirdly, and last, we should consider technological superiority as a key element of effective deterrence. Research and development plays a major role in assessing relevant advanced technologies. The paradigm is not only the result of our quest for technological superiority. Through it, we can avoid the strategic surprises thanks to scientific and technological breakthroughs and innovations. The ability to preserve peace comes from the capacity to deter war. We also have to protect our technological superiority through relevant and efficient export controls to ensure that we stay one step ahead of the competition. Finally, we need a robust industrial environment conducive to cooperation. Europe's defense industry cannot remain 
fragmented any longer. The bulk of defense capability, particularly next generation platform, should be developed and procured globally. It will require not only an all-around revolution on how we handle military procurement, but a profound situation awareness as well. Through well-developed situation awareness, we can adapt more diversified scientific knowledge and technology to support our aims. The Italian aerospace and defense industry ranks among the top 10 worldwide and can actively shape European and Atlantic industrial cooperation. We have been developing technological, technologically advanced defense capability to cope with the rapidly changing current conflict scenarios. Our experience indicates that matching the need of the armed forces requires an adequate level of constant investment in research and development to fulfill our technological needs. However, our budget are limited and our acquisition must be effective and efficient. Therefore, we are obliged to make sure that we spend every single euro wisely. Let me briefly recall some of the international programs that rank high on uh, the agenda of the Italian armed forces. We acquired electronic intelligence technology from L3 Ares. And uh, of course, we are a very active member of the Lockheed Martin F-35 program. It is through well-balanced acquisition decisions such as these that the Italian armed forces can operate effectively in denied airspace and across a multi-domain environment while significantly increasing our ability to predict an opponent's next moves. Within European Union, we are working on two major capability development projects of strategic importance. The MAIL RPS, or Eurodrome, and the ESOR which will boost our armed force interoperability by developing European and standard communication technologies. The devastating impact of inadequate communication and the inability to communicate across secure networks is a daily evidence in Ukraine. Italy can offer technological capabilities to strengthen Europe's next tank, the main ground combat system, MGCS. In addition, the Italian Army has a great interest in uh, exploring the potential of a future multinational helicopter program, the next generation rotorcraft, cap rotorcraft capability, NGRC, jointly with France, Germany, Greece, and the UK. But we also are, uh, see great potential in the future vertical lift, v uh, FVL, which is generating very high interest. Italy participate in the Tempest program with which uh, the future sixth generation fighter aircraft is being developed. We often keep uh, our focus on initiative concerning the surface of the planet. However, we should not forget the other initiative and objective beyond our low heart orbit. Humankind first set foot on the moon over 50 years ago and our satellite is again within sensor range. Nations are now in a race to develop lunar navigation technologies, as well as navigational technology to accommodate routine cislunar travel across the space between Earth and, Earth and the Moon. Italy is also taking part in efforts and initiatives concerning space-related navigation issue and seeks to expand its participation with, with the United States in these matters. As we see, the aerospace and defense industry will experience a technological liftoff, and this calls for the capa capacity of our political, military, diplomatic, and industrial institution to build up, build up a multi-level approach based on solid partnership and international cooperation, both inside and outside European Union frameworks. The same approach also dictates that we execute a long-term capacity planning in the 10 to 15 years range. 
we, fully, we are fully aware that the current international scenario has triggered a new momentum in NATO and European defense. Beyond that, it will influence national defense budget and foster a global high-tech competition in such areas as cyber and space. Moreover, the privileged relationship between multiple NATO and European Union institutions, the European Defense Industrial Base, and other entities providing expert analysis, all of which compete and cooperate to shape, set, and support European Union policy agenda, also facilitate such momentum. More substantial, multi-level dialogue and cooperation should be our key priorities in this respect. The time has come for our high-tech defense industry to adjust its business models and achieve more agility, supported, of course, by more streamlined national defense acquisition regulation. Our acquisition process takes too long and, in some cases, result in the delivery of obsolete systems. At the same time, however, we can adjust to the current and future needs of our armed forces swiftly. In an, uncertain, in an uncertain world, preparing for the future requires innovative vision, entrepreneurial courage. It took me two days for entrepreneurial courage and streamlined acquisition policies. That is how we ensure our forces have the skill and capabilities to adapt swiftly to new challenges and unexpected circumstances. We already have uh, the resources to, uh, add, to, set out, uh, to set our needs in motion through European Union financial programs and the national budget. Collectively, the European countries are the second largest military spender worldwide. Therefore, it is the right time to strengthen the concept of pooling and sharing in order to gain real traction in the European Union and NATO environments. In the light of this new era of East-West confrontation, we must be able to effectively increase and expand our capabilities in the land, maritime, air, space, cyber and cognitive domains. domains. As a result, future conflict will manifest a more extended range across all domains and a much greater physical and cognitive speed. Okay, concluding, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is undoubtedly the most severe conflict Europe has faced in the post-World War II era. Escalating tension between Russia and the West, uh, Western countries are quite an abrupt reminder of the bad old days in the Cold War. Peace and security at home should no longer be taken for granted, and the stake for the international community are very high. Let me finish by reading what uh, President uh, Eisenhower said in a Cross of Iron speech back in 1953. And I quote, this world in arm is not a way of life at all, in any true sense. Under the cloud of, threatening, of a threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron." Unquote. Today, this world could not be more meaningful. Thank you. Thank you very much. A wonderful quote uh, at the end. Thanks for the broad overview of the implications of the changing strategic landscape and what they mean for Italy, for the U.S.-Italian relationship, uh, and then for Europe more broadly. Let me just begin, uh, Admiral, by asking you about, uh, you talked a little about deterrence. So with the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and the possible uh, expansion of NATO this year to countries like Sweden and Finland, there is a lot of question about deterrence along the eastern flank of NATO. So from your perspective, what sort of capabilities from an Italian defense perspective are important for deterring future conflict? Uh, when we look at the current war in Ukraine, we see a lot of standoff weapons, uh, some high precision, some not. 
there's a lot of use of uh, air defense systems. Uh, we've seen strikes against um, uh, ships, including the Moskva, so anti-ship capabilities. So from a deterrent standpoint and from an Italian standpoint, what are the capabilities uh, over the next several years that are going to be important priorities for you from an Italian perspective? Well, we have been witnessing a, a, let's, let me, let me say an old-fashioned war. I mean, th this, this event has been characterized by a strong uh, uh, employment of cyber in shaping the battlefield and in uh, governing and, and, and in, in, we're running the battlefield. So, but we still feel the, 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 the noise of, uh, of uh, artillery, tanks, something that, uh, that was not unexpected, but sincerely it was not the front line. So we have to review a little bit our, our posture. From our standpoint, from the Italian point, standpoint, one of the very, very first priorities is get, get our, our army up to speed in these in this, uh, this new scenarios. Uh, both and the, the challenge will be okay feed and keep up with the legacy but look at the future because deterrence my, my, my point of view deterrence probably is shifting from um, the nuclear deterrence to the technological one so we need to be able to product and be able to use properly very very advanced technological system that can deter them to start a conventional war because it's not going to be worthy anymore because of this advance in technology that we have to pursue and probably to increase so the deterrence will be not be anymore a nuclear one but a technological one and we have to to strive for that so is this for example why along with the UK and Sweden you're working on developing Tempest, for example, yeah. sixth generation aircraft. Uh, we've seen the Russians struggle to gain air superiority in Ukraine, but what role do you see the Tempest playing in the Italian military and the future operating environment, and how does that fit in with what you've just laid out? My personal uh, wish is that, I mean, you know, we have Tempest going on, on X, uh, North to south and FKS going, I mean, uh, east, east, uh, west, uh, west to east. Uh, that's a duplication. Hopefully, something's going to happen that I mean we'll try to 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 fix it. Um, Tempest, like Tempest, is sixth generation, but like a fifth generation. We have we need to have a fifth generation uh, air system, mm -hmm. being able to talk to communicate, to exchange data with the ships and with the boots on the ground. So it's, it's something that we have to, to put, I mean, to synchronize and have all of them ready to, to exchange data very rapidly because this is, I mean, the way we can switch to uh, MDO, multi-domain operation. That's the only way we can do it. Connectivity, same way of language, same speed, and really a strong, strong uh, uh, flow of, uh, of uh, data flow that can keep the situation, the whole situation awareness up to speed ready. Yeah, and across multiple countries right. of quickly course. and multiple different platforms okay. and systems. I mean, we can see the need to share information that's coming off of uh, aircraft right. or, dr or drones. Right to be moved quickly if there's a need to conduct missile strikes. Yeah. It's the speed is important. Yeah. So how do you share that across multiple countries when right. we're talking Europe? And having multiple countries is just transferring the same, the same situation we had in, the, in this war. I mean, uh, the, con the, the, the fighters has been, let's say, Ukraine and uh, Russia, but behind Ukraine there was there was the, the international community and the NATO, the alliance, which proved to be the alliance, the backbone of a military alliance. But again, on one side, we have a one-man show, Mr. Putin. He was deciding the way he wanted. On the other side, there's a little bit more of a to get 
everybody, I mean, uh, in, a, in the same idea. When he gave us a strong message back uh, last year, at the end of last year, and he moved, I think, 5,000 paratroops from Russia, requested by Kazakhstan, mm. in 72 hours. My question is, would NATO be able to move 5,000 troops in 72 hours? I don't have an answer. I don't have the answer. I just <coughs> throw the answer to the, to the audience. But again, this is another message that we need to honor. One, one, uh, one issue that comes out of this, and, and you're, you're in the United States at the moment, uh, in, uh, in part to meet with U.S. officials, is how have exercises, operations been helpful in dealing with this? You've conducted real-world tri-carrier operations. Uh, Earlier this year, I think the U.S. and the Italian navies participated in exercises and activities such as Neptune Strike 2022 uh, and assorted bilateral drills. Have those been helpful in uh, trying to, f to fix some of these challenges? And how do you see U.S.-Italian uh, cooperation moving forward? It has been usual because, I mean, our exercises magically shifted a little bit more eastward. So the, 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 the area of operation for the exercise has been moved, of course. Has been moved to, to give a strong signal that we were there. And I think it, was, it has been usual because, I mean, we put the aircraft carriers at that range in which Ukraine was reachable. And so that, that was something, something in addition to, to what the alliance, the alliance put uh, on a... On a, on a on a balance to try to try to balance what what was the overwhelming uh, power of uh, Russia. Uh, it is useful. It is useful because magically, when you train in normal in peacetime, you train by the book. I think that's what I heard from my my side from my part. When you train in a crisis environment, your training has a, a capital T on, on on the beginning. That's yeah. something that we got we got. Just doing it, we realized that after that happened. A uh, couple of questions uh, that I want to get to on defense, Italian defense planning. But uh, let me first uh, see if you have, have any thoughts. Uh, we've heard U.S. officials uh, openly supportive of the expansion of NATO to Finland and Sweden. Um, any thoughts on the deliberations coming up later this year on, uh, on NATO expansion? As far as uh, Finland and Sweden is, it, I think that will be, will, they will submit their application. I think in the next days. But that's a typical political political matter, and I'm usually by by my DNA I stay very far stay away. Stay out of that. The, yeah, of course. <laughs> and I think I'm sitting here just because I did it in my past, probably. But uh, no, it's it's something. Else. They are more than welcome. We have just taken into consideration that Finland is right on the edge. Yeah. I have been in, um, in uh, Latvia recently, and even if it is a, an operation pretty similar to other we are conducting, when you are there and everything is uh, very organized, everything is very set up, but you feel that the distance is very, 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 very small. And that's the feeling of the population in that area, in the, in the, the Baltic uh, countries. And probably Finland will be pretty much the same. So it will be uh, delicate uh, managing of their, whenever they will be in, uh, it, it's difficult to be a part of the NATO in Finland compared to be part of the NATO in Italy, for example. Sure. Because of distance. Yes, and it, this is where deterrence suddenly becomes right. critical because right. uh, you certainly want to deter any and kind of. I'm sorry if I interrupt you. Being there, the danger of escalation is higher and higher because the mistake, the misunderstanding, here has a, has a, has a significant significance. There, it's very, very, very much more, very more, much more delicate. Yeah. So they have, to, they have to handle not only the, the deterrence and the defensive posture, but also how to handle the case that could arise. If they want to, to push the red button immediately or just try to understand what's, what is going on. I wanted to shift a little bit, if I can, to uh, uh, Italian defense planning priorities. 
that there's been a rise in Italian military procurement. Uh, there which, will be. There will be. There will be. There will be. Uh, well, uh, according to our data, uh, a rise from 2021 data to 2020 data, so a rise in procurement. The, the question, though, is really uh, w what are the key plans uh, and focus areas. We've seen interest in DDX destroyers or amphibious vehicles. Where, where are the areas that are important uh, as part of future procurement decisions? Okay. Uh, first, speaking about the, the rise of the uh, internal gross product, the famous 2%, that's going to happen on a six-year time frame because correctly, like our Minister of Defense said, I mean, it is, not, it is not something that can, hap can happen abruptly. I mean, we need to take into consideration all the problems we are going to get from the end of pandemia, from the economical point of view, from the war. So we are also facing, I mean, a family with no income. We are facing uh, uh, energy problem, alternatives that we need to, to, to find. So this is a pretty huge equation in which our budget get in, but must be, must be put in, in, in tight conjunction with other problems we are facing, we are, we are uh, expecting to face in, in the next future. This is why the, the, the famous 2% will be, I mean... 2028, we've yeah, seen. 2028 and we've seen the, 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 the five-star movements yes, come yes, publicly. Yes, that made everybody happy. Everybody <laughs> happy. Uh, on that, on, um, uh, with that horizon, uh, priority is our army. Even if I'm a navy, if, if, even if I'm a navy guy, but I'm wearing the proper uniform of jointness, but no army needs uh, is uh, the minimum the, the minimum required for legacy for legacy system, and then project them in the future because they must be kept up to speed for the fifth and sixth generation uh, environment and be able to to be part of the game and play their role in the the whole MDO environment. Uh, we are looking looking for looking forward for the sixth generation aircraft, the Tempest One or whatever you want to call them. Um, of course, uh, probably having seen, and these are probably two priorities with the strategic lift. We don't want to be any more dependent on Ukraine and Russia lift because, I mean, they are having other problems and we need to be, I mean, autonomous on that and we are working on that. Uh, then, um, also, I mean, the, the Mediterranean is very, very crowded. Uh, in the Mediterranean, there are state and non-state actors that are, I mean, doing their, 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 they are coming in. In the Mediterranean, we depend 92% uh, on um, data and oil by submarine cables and uh, ducts, and we have to defend them. And there are a lot of uh, submarines and there are a lot of uh, Russian ships. Russia doesn't seem to, to move from the area, the areas in which they are now, Libya, I mean, uh, East Libya, now they are getting in Mali. Whenever we leave a vacuum, the, the private company like Wagner are jumping in. So it's uh, something, uh, that's, why we, we, that's why Italy speak about uh, the wider Mediterranean area, which goes from uh, Gulf of Guinea up to, to Horn, of, uh, Horn of Africa. And, and, and we see the Russians continue to use their, uh, uh, their naval base in Tartus yeah, and, and they are Syria. Building. They are building some in, uh, in Sudan, I think. In Sudan as well, that's uh, correct. Tartus is just is the, the metropolis. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, and we need to take this into consideration. Uh, hopefully, getting these, these events, unfortunately, probably we get the alliance uh, tighter because sometime in the past we had somebody from the alliance which were, were, go, were going, uh, uh, were going uh, I mean, a little bit uh, by themselves. And so this is something that is going to generate a, a phenomenon of getting the alliance uh, tied together. Uh, waking up uh, European Union to go forward to the famous European defense, uh, which will be complementary to the NATO. I mean, just make it clear that there will be no duplication, no overlap, but, but European Union defense eventually will be the, the, the column, European column of the alliance. So we need to see that in this, in this, in this perspective. That's an interesting point. It's a good point. How, how do you see, how do you talk about um, uh, the, the way you're thinking, Italy is thinking about its role in NATO moving forward 
and the European Union, and how do you think about uh, complementarity? Are there worries about duplication of efforts yeah. along those lines? We must be aware. Uh, n no way. I mean, first of all, the Ukrainian crisis demonstrated that NATO is the alliance. I mean, the one who is strong, determined, and everybody is participating with the willing of really being part of something which is operationally eff effective and, uh, and uh, politically uh, have a weight. European Union, the, 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 the path is still long going to do. Probably you have to fix a little bit the uh, European Union foreign policy and on that we can work on the European Union defense which now is pretty much uh, uh, focused on capability and modularity of different countries being able to, to furnish, to give units which are supposedly, I mean, already tuned up for the, I think it is the PSC, is the, 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 the entity who is uh, uh, running, running the European Union missions, but again, the, the horizon is to have forces, I mean, uh, permanently, permanent, permanently uh, detached to the European Union and mainly uh, C2, I mean, a uh, chain of command uh, strong, mm -hmm. reliable, mm -hmm. efficient, quick in decision making. These are the things that we are, we are looking for, but no overlapping and no duplication with NATO. This is, this is a must. Um, one question uh, just on capabilities, uh, noticed uh, Italian and French efforts to develop an uh, updated version of the SAMT ballistic missile defense system. Can you talk about just sort of broader uh, uh, missile defense and how you're thinking about the future evolution of missile defense? I say that in part because uh, for any of the conflict scenarios that we look at, uh, there, that adversaries, uh, w whether it's the Russian scenario or others, Iranian threats to, to Europe, uh, significant standoff capabilities from a number of countries. Yeah, uh, I forgot, and thank you for telling. Uh, integrated missile defense is one of the priorities for us. We have, you know that we have the integrated uh, system with, with, the, with the allies, and uh, I mean, SAMPT is one of, a part of it. Uh, we, I, I think we, we, we use it in uh, Karaman Maras down in, uh, in Turkey. It is working properly. It is, it is really, really a, a, a efficient part of the, of the whole system. Um, on this, probably there should be a, a really step ahead strong because we saw the hypersonic missile. Uh, the, everybody says that it is not interceptable. Probably it is at the very, 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 very early stage. But the very, very, very early stage, you can detect, track, and probably uh, hit with satellites. So again, this is something that goes back It just back doesn't to have the, the ballistic trajectory, no. so it makes no. it, it's, no. it's no. a uh, low right. flight path. Makes that it a lot That was another message of uh, President Putin, but probably if we can make something, if we can do something, it will be at the very, very early stage when, uh, when it starts and having the chance to see from, from above. So you mentioned space, and I know it's something you've talked about in the past as well. Uh, you've also expressed a concern about protecting satellites. Uh, we've seen ASAT anti-satellite tests uh, by a number of countries, including the Russians, over the last year. So what are the key threats that you see in space, and how, do you, how are you thinking about the protection of space-based assets? Recently, our, thanks to our minister, we finally uh, changed the, the Italian law in which we emphasize, underline, and pin, pin that uh, defense is going to be a crucial primary actor in, uh, in, in space and cyber, because that was not clear at, up to that point that defense must be probably the key player in these, uh, in these uh, dominions. Uh, one of the things that we have to achieve first, and we are strongly st studying, is uh, first 
space assets. Up to now, we are we are uh, asking other countries time. Uh, we pick our ticket and stay in queue, waiting for our time to to send to to send satellites on on a on the sky. So first of all, we should have an, a, an independent assets. Asset, asset so, uh, in a space. On that end, space is uh, still a place where there is no law. So first, it's on a first arrived, first served basis, we are we are managing that. There are still still the agreement are pretty much pretty much working without any kind of rule. My personal opinion, we got a strong message from Mr. Putin, Putin in November 2021 when he shot down a 1982 satellite, which was unusual. Everybody was talking about uh, the debris, 1,500 debris, and we thought that these would have been hitting everything, you know, either our, our international Space station, station, so everybody running uh, in, uh, in uh, the emergency shuttle and so on, but nothing happened. The thing was that it showed us that probably we will we will fight. Uh, will be that cinetic direct fighting on, on in space. I don't know, but space will be will be a ground, a common ground in which we have to just try to to get our. And again, it will be on a, on the alliance base because we are really our space program are very very much triggered and and hook to the to the alliance alliance uh, uh, attitude and perspective but uh, that's something that we have to do and move all together with the allies one one question or one issue that you mentioned earlier uh, in our discussion was uh, issues related to Italian security and the Mediterranean mm -hmm. um, and we spent a lot of time talking about conventional issues even nuclear and then broader deterrence can you just spend uh, a minute or so talking about uh, the other security issues that you're dealing with that are Mediterranean and probably African-based, which are illegal migration, uh, uh, some uh, continuing terrorism challenges. Uh, we've got still a, a jihadist activity in Africa, whether it's in the Sahel, uh, it's in Libya, uh, Somalia, or, or, or other countries. What other concerns do you have and how are you dealing with broader uh, threats emanating uh, up through the Mediterranean that you have to deal with? Dr drugs, yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah, uh, first, when I was in the Navy, first the thing that we try to do is try to to disseminate the, the maritime, uh, maritime uh, thought, cautions, because I mean, uh, I think that in the past we have been suffering a lot of uh, uh, sea blindness, not being aware that our coastline, so our border, our wet border, are seven times the dry one, I mean the one from the north. So some, that's something that the Italian, the Italian in, a, in, a, in a first grade school should, should learn. That seems to be easy, it seems to be f funny, but we need to, we need to grow this uh, this uh, uh, capacity to understand how, how dependent we are from uh, from uh, from the sea. We also are also are dependent because uh, we are a transformation country, so we got everything. I mean, materials from from 95% uh, uh, from sea, mm -hmm. and then we export. I mean, final product. So again, this is something important. And then coming from south specifically, the threat of uh, Im illegal immigration and. Uh, the terrorism. Sometimes they are overlapping. You know, we have we have some example that they came over through that that uh, flow. Uh, this is a concern. This is a concern that, by, from my point of view, when we face it in the Mediterranean, is too late. So we are already surrounded. We are under siege, and we have to react. We should be. We should go further where the everything starts. I mean, we are doing that in in the sub sahel Nigeria is a demographic bomb that we are expect to explode around 2035, 2050. And we have to try to solve the problem, but they're helping their countries over there in, in, in uh, taking the, the, the security uh, under, under control. Probably, uh, this is our, our, my caution that is speaking, probably we should spend better and more money there to, to, to rise their the, the way they lie, the, the way they live, help them in in in, uh, in 
building up their their own economy. I mean, they have, I mean, huge amount of of uh, uh, potential money with with all minerals they have. My question is: Is there any country who is doing, who is having a colonial uh, behavior still now in 2022? I would say yes, and this is a, a guilty feeling we should have. So we should turn. 180 degrees our policy toward that country, help them out in, in solving their problem before they, they are knocking on our, at, at our door and of course we have, to, we have to have them on board, we cannot leave them alone. Uh, but this is, a, this is a problem. And also the south flank which we are trying to, to, uh, to tell NATO that now we are doing a lot of effort Eastward, so mm -hmm. Italy is is is, uh, is in in some time in is Island, in the Baltic uh, countries, in Poland, in Hungary, and then in the next future in uh, the Bulgaria, in the Kosovo, in uh, in, uh, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. But our main threat axis is from south, and that area, that direction, is also where we should try to find some alternatives in energies not to be totally dependent from Russia. So that area is something that Italy as a NATO member is expecting that the NATO, the NATO nation will help us maybe in the second time when uh, Ukraine will be solved in, in facing this problem, in sharing altogether the illegal immigration uh, problem that things that uh, has not been done in the past, they, we have been left alone. And so we need to review altogether mm -hmm. our posture. Well, we're almost done, but we have a few audience questions. Uh, folks have written in. Uh, the, the first one is, and we've talked a little bit about this, is on uh, your thoughts on greater integration of EU military efforts. So how, how is Italy, from a defense budget planning procurement standpoint, uh, thinking about deepening integration of uh, European Union military efforts. Today's picture shows that probably, I mean, roughly, we have in Europe, even if we are pretty much doing and preparing for the same type of confrontation, crisis, war, whatever you want to, we have more than 130 uh, weapon systems different. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are doing the same stuff. I mean, are, are having the same, the same uh, uh, aim in doing, uh, in producing effects. So probably we need to, to work this out. We need to push the European industry in uh, much more uh, collaborations. There is too much fragmentation right now. So we need to, I mean, we spend a lot of money as Europe countries in, in, in the defense, as I said. So it's time to, to get uh, more uh, international programs, fulfilling more nations' needs, and try to reduce the huge, uh, uh, unbearable amount of, of a uh, weapon system that we have right now, standardized, standardized systems, standardized procedures, standardized communication. And that's the way to that's the way to do it, and also to improve, I think, interoperability as well course, as the course, standardization. Of, yes, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Well, uh, Admiral, we really appreciate uh, your time uh, with us at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thanks for your thoughts. Uh, as someone who spent many years uh, uh, in the U.S. Department of Defense in Afghanistan, I spent considerable time in places like Herat uh, with Italian forces. Uh, not only were they outstanding colleagues, but I think the best food I had <laughs> with international forces was uh, with Italian that helps, forces. That helps, you know. That helps. That's right. That that improves morale uh, right. there. I want you. To, I, I want to thank you again for spending time with us today. Really appreciate it, and thanks for all of the uh, collaboration and support that Italy has provided to the U.S. over the years. That relationship remains we'll important. We'll Great. Continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.